What is up, fellow nerds, and welcome back to the Dapper Snapper Gaming Channel, and welcome back to How Do I Want to Do This? This is our series where we take a look at all playable options available to players in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, then we rank them on a scale of 1 to 10, and either build them or fix them depending on how they rank. Now today we are taking on a bit of a doozy with the Circle of the Land Druid, so there is a lot to go through. So we're going to jump right into it, but before we do, make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe if you haven't already. We are very close to 1,400 subscribers, so please go ahead and uh, push us over the edge there and just go ahead and get us to 2000 while we're at it that's our goal for the end of the year and i think we can do it but i need your help and of course make sure that you click the bell once you have done that so that you're notified when new videos are uploaded and share the video with your friends so the circle of the land druid really takes what it is to be a druid and turns it up a little bit higher in that you really make wherever you're from a part of you. You get to take the option of a bunch of different types of lands in which you could hail from and that kind of shapes your entirety of the subclass which makes this subclass a lot more customizable than other subclasses are. However, it also makes ranking this a lot more difficult. So let's go ahead and jump in and see what we think. At level two, we actually get three features, and the first is a bonus cantrip, and that does exactly what it says. You get one extra cantrip when you hit level two from your druid list. Nothing too crazy about that. It's a seven out of 10 feature for me. Having an extra cantrip is always gonna be nice, right? There's always that one extra cantrip that you want, that you didn't have room for, and this just gives you that flexibility. So not a whole lot to talk about, but just having an extra cantrip is really good. Also at level two, we get natural recovery, and this allows us to actually gain back spell slots equal to half of our druid level. And how this works is if we are a level six druid, then we can gain up to three levels of spell slots. So we could take a third level spell slot, we could take a second and a first level spell slot, or three first level spell slots, depending on what we've used up or what we need. This is quite handy right and this actually allows us to get a lot more usage out of our spell slots of course they come back on a long rest instead of a short rest so getting back this after a after a tough fight and being well charged up for the rest of the day can be really helpful the thing about natural recovery that's a little weird in the way that it's worded though is that it says during a short rest you can do this its brother feature, Arcane Recovery over on the wizard list, says when you finish a short rest. So this can get a little weird. Technically, you could say, I'm starting a short rest and use this feature. It does not say that it takes X amount of time, like six seconds or whatever. It just says during a short rest. So you could, in the middle of combat, say, I'm taking a short rest. You've declared it and you've, you've taken it. It doesn't say you have to complete it. So then after that six seconds, could you gain back all of your spell slots? I personally don't think so, but the way that it's worded, maybe you can. So that's something to talk to your DM about for sure. I think that's a little strange and I think that's an extreme situation, but technically rules as written, you probably could get away with it. It's weird. So overall, this is going to be an 8 out of 10. Getting back spell slots is always going to be amazing. This could be spammable if you read it super rules as written. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, it's just one of those things where the wording wasn't uh, super carefully thought out. And so it's, it's, just, it's just a little weird. Finally, at level 2, we get circle spells. And this is where the subclass really uh, defines itself. At this point, you get to choose a land that you hail from, and it can be from the following choices. Arctic, coast, desert, forest, grassland, mountain, swamp, or underdark. And all of these give you extra spells that you can add on to your spell list, which is really cool. Now, this was the only one that did this up until Tasha's came out. So this definitely was a defining feature up until Tasha's came out. But even then, Tasha's only gives you one option for that, for that subclass. This one gives you all of these right here. And so I'm just gonna flash them across the screen as, as fast as I can here. And I'm just going to mention a few standout options here. There are several, actually. Um, so they count just like things like the Cleric List did as far as having extra prepared spells on there. Um, things like the Artificer, same thing that we've talked about on the channel. Um, they just count as ones that you know and ones that are always prepared for you. So the Arctic is nice getting things like Cone of Cold, Ice Storm, Slow especially. I really like the Slow spell here. Um, Coast, Mirror Image is great to have always ready to go as well as misty step uh, desert 
Desert's okay, I guess. None of them are are super great, in my opinion. Um, Forest is nice, but most of these are things that you already get access to. Uh, Grassland, invisibility, haste, dream is not too bad. I mean, so there's there's some cool stuff there. Uh, Mountain, you get spider climb, spike growth, which you already had access to, but they're not too bad. Pass wall is cool. Again, I, I really like pass wall situationally like if it comes prepared i'm never going to complain but typically i'm not going to prepare it if i don't already get it it's just it's just one of those weird ones uh swamp of course you get things like scrying for free but like the rest of it's kind of meh uh but under dark getting things like web gaseous form greater invisibility cloud kill insect plague those are pretty cool too so obviously this is a nightmare from a ranking perspective because obviously there is a variance in power here and you're locked into this rules as written when you choose this at the beginning of your journey here at level two now one thing that's kind of interesting about this that i've seen online that some people will homebrew and this is totally up to you and not rules as written but i have seen people take it to where whenever you rest in a new place so say you're from the arctic but you rest on the coast then your prepared list actually changes to that of where you've rested i've never tested this out myself so i'm not sure whether or not i would allow this but i'd love to know in the comments below what you think of this of taking on the land that you are resting in those be your new spell lists. So I think it's interesting. I don't know how I feel about it, but we're just gonna rank this from a rules as written perspective. It's it's tough, right? Because you could you're totally varied on which one that you pick. You could pick the absolute best one for your campaign, and you've got all these spells just ready to go that are always gonna be good. You could also pick that exact same one and go to in a different campaign and you feel like you're never going to use them. And so that's where this can get a little tough, right? So I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. I'm going to put a big asterisk next to it because it's one of those where in the right campaign, this will be an, a 9 or a 10. In the wrong campaign, this will be like a 4 or a 5. So it's it's really hard to rank this and it's really hard to quantify something with so many options that you're locked into and you may or may not know what is best for down the road when you have to choose this early on. Next up, at level 6, we get Land Stride, and this allows us to basically ignore any non-magical difficult terrain, which is really, really nice. In addition to this, we also have advantage on saving throws against plants that are trying to stop our movement, things like the Entangle spell being one of the primary examples. This isn't bad, right? Difficult terrain is something that will come up. Now, I will say, in, in my experience, a lot of it is magical. Uh, a, a good bit of it is magical. However, you're going to run into things like where a rock slide has occurred, and so that's kind of difficult terrain. You can just run across that as if it were no problem at all. Uh, there, there will be some natural elements that uh, you will be able to shine in, but again, this is a little situational, and it can be great in the right setting, or it can be trash in the wrong setting. So overall, I'm going to give this a 7 as well. Um, again, it's good in some places, it's bad in others so it just it kind of sits there in the middle of useful a lot of the time but sometimes you'll never see this feature come across at level 10 we get nature's ward and we gain immunity to charmed and frightened effects when coming from elementals and fey and we actually become immune to poison and disease as well now becoming immune to poison and disease is pretty nice being charmed and frightened by elementals and fey i yes fey like to do that However, again, you're only looking at two types of creatures. And so again, we're looking at a very dependent on your setting type of thing. Again, making this really hard to rank because it might be really good in one situation, but it might be not good at all in others where this doesn't come up. If you go your entire campaign and don't see any elementals or fey past level 10, you're gonna feel like this is completely useless. Whereas if you run through a campaign where it's a ton of fey, you're going to feel pretty good, right? This is going to come up all the time in that situation. So again, I've got to put this at a seven where it could go either way depending on your situation. And again, this is just kind of the theme of the subclass. At level 14, we get Nature Sanctuary, and this allows us to actually have a bit of a, uh, 
a bit of a ward whenever certain types of creatures are attacking us. So, whenever a beast or plant tries to attack us, they then have to make a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail, they need to choose a new target, or they automatically miss the attack against us. If they succeed on the saving throw, then they are immune to this effect for 24 hours, and the creature knows the risk whenever they make this attack. Ah, oh, this is rough. It's 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 not good, right? Here's the thing. Beasts only go up to a T-Rex, right? A T-Rex is the highest level beast, at least in the monster manual. Your DM may make a homebrew creature that is a higher CR. That's totally fine, in which case that's that's whatever, but I'm not considering homebrew here. Plants, same thing. Plants are low CR overall, so unless you're fighting a bunch of them in order to balance out your encounter, you're not going to see a bunch of high-level stuff unless there's a bunch of them. How common is that going to be? Well, it depends on your campaign. And that, again, you're not getting a lot of blanket useful features. It's stuff that's situational. And that makes this very difficult. The other thing that makes this difficult is the fact that the creature knows about it when they go to make the attack. So obviously this can help you to survive a lot longer in wild shape. If the creature just straight up can't hit you, then that's great. But I mean, they're gonna do this every time they attack until they succeed. And then once they succeed, then this feature goes away. So you're on a pretty short timer no matter what you do. And so that also kind of sucks. I've got to give this a six out of 10. I, I can't give it the same ranking because the, the fact that the creature is aware that they're going to have to make this save before they do it is a lot of times going to make them just target somebody else other than you, which is great for you, but may not be great for your squishy wizard, may not be great for your squishy sorcerer who don't have a whole lot of HP and are wearing no armor. That can end up being an issue. So I think six is kind of high, honestly, for this. I want to give it a five, but I think six is better, um, but it's, it's, it's not that great. So where does this leave us with the Circle of the Land Druid? This is the epitome of, well, it depends. <laughs> it, it really depends on your setting. It depends on what you're doing on a, a particular day. It depends on where you are in a particular day. It depends on what role you need to be within the party. And with that possibly evolving over time, yes, you can swap out your spell list from day to day of your core spells. So that does give you that ability to swap things out. Yes, you can swap your wild shape option as long as you have seen the creature. Your wild shape isn't buffed really in any way on this subclass, so again, your scaling is not good. Uh, a CR1 creature is going to take maximum two hits once you're getting up to these higher levels, and that's if you're lucky and possibly have gotten some temporary HP from somewhere. Uh, you know, 37 damage on a dire wolf, once you're hitting levels, you know, above level 10, you might take that in one hit, in which case, whatever. I mean, it's still a sponge, but it's still not great. So overall, these features are just situational. You may pick the correct uh, terrain and get everything that's that's perfect for you. You may want that blastery type. And so you take something like uh, the Underdark, right? The Underdark gives you that ability to climb. You have the web, and then you can hit them with a cloud kill. Um, you have insect plague there to do some stuff. So that's really nice, right? You know, if you're doing a water type campaign where you're out on the ocean, then the coast druid is going to be pretty nice, right? You have water breathing and water walk. You get control water a little later, and those are going to feel really, really good to have. But then if you're on land most of the time, then your mirror image and misty step are going to be great. But your entire list of spells that you're getting at fifth level doesn't help you at all. Uh, freedom of movement is okay at seventh level. And then so you don't get really anything else that's really nice until ninth level with conjure elemental and scrying. So it's, it's tough, right? You have to make this big decision beforehand. So this is something I would talk to your DM about and see if you can possibly start to predict which one is going to be best. Ultimately, though, I've got to give this a 7 out of 10. It's not a bad subclass, but it varies wildly. So, of course, I'm putting an asterisk here because you can get a 10 out of 10 or you can end up with a 4 out of 10, just depending on what you choose. That's what makes this one difficult. So pick this one, play it, but pick wisely. 
So that is all for today's video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Later this week, we're going to be building one together where I have to pick which one of these things that I want to do, which is a difficult decision. But until then, stay safe out there, stay healthy, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.